about neighborhoods in the Charlottesville area that are underperforming, undervalued, fine line between underperforming, undervalued, and upside and potential. Where's that line? Where's that fine line between upside and potential and underperforming and undervalued? It's somewhere in the middle and it's very close. And I highlighted a couple of neighborhoods, Charlottesville area, that if you wanted to make some money as an investor or if you wanted to make some money by living in the property for two years to minimize capital gains exposure, when you hit the two-year marker, you then sell. Um, some of the neighborhoods that I highlighted were 10th and Page. I think right now, 10th and Page, you have an opportunity for value. Um, the neighborhood's gentrifying, and it's dealing with crime, and the brand is in peril. I think you have a similar circumstance with Fifeville. I think Star Hill, that neighborhood, right on the next level. I think you still have pockets of Hogwaller and Woolen Mills, where you have a lot of potential and upside. A friend of the program and, and one of the key influencers of the I Love Seville Network, John Blair, highlights that maybe a dark horse neighborhood, when you look at Ivy and the University of Virginia and all the projects happening there, the Lewis Mountain neighborhood, he suggests. And he goes further by saying, when you look at the Lewis Mountain neighborhood from a commercial and university expansion development standpoint, you have to wonder what that neighborhood's going to look like. And I agree with John. I've said it on this program a number of times. I think that Lewis Mountain neighborhood with the upsoding, and let's identify what Lewis Mountain is. It's that neighborhood across from Foods of All Nations, the, the neighborhood that's kind of in between um, where the hotel and the conference center and the data science school are going to go and the Boar's Head, the neighborhood across the street from the university shopping center where Lou Stevens' racket and tennis shop is located, where the Papa John's is located across from the car wash, the neighborhood that's on the same side of the road where Sasha Farmer's real estate firm is located, that neighborhood where the Catholic Church is located, walking distance to the university, walking distance to the corner, walking distance to grounds, walking distance to anywhere. I mean, one of the best neighborhoods, Lewis Mountain. But you look at what's happening in that quarter and you have to ask yourself, is that neighborhood as we know it today going to stay the same a generation from now? And you're legitimately got to think it's going to become way more student housing. That's something we talked about on the show. Um, we have some positive news to highlight on the program. It's, it's bittersweet to say this. Is it positive when police make arrests of 13-year-olds with guns and police make arrests 19-year-olds charged with murder? Yes, it's positive. It's positive. The community should be breathing somewhat of a sigh of relief today thanks to the good, good the strong efforts in the investigative uh, police work utilized by both the Charlottesville Police Department and the Albemarle County Police Department. That's the lead of today's show. Charlottesville Police have arrested a 19-year-old and, and, and have charged him with murder. Uh, the 19-year-old... Um, Mm, directly tied to the murder of Hardy Drive and a 20-year-old Gordonsville man. A 20-year-old Gordonsville man that had a lot of promise and potential. A 20-year-old Gordonsville man who drove into the 10th and Page area, Hardy Drive specifically, to potentially, allegedly purchase um, drugs of some kind. Um, he was in a truck with his brother, much to the community's disappointment and much to the community's heartbreak. Um, the drug deal is botched. It leads to a 20-year-old Gordonsville man who's got a girlfriend, a family, a promising future. It leads to his murder. He speeds away from Hardy Drive after getting shot, found dead on page. A crossing guard, one of the first to arrive at the scene. Minutes before this, children were left off a bus dropped off, filed out of a bus. So really just a, 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 a situation you never want. But if there is some potential closure, Cotchis, police chief, newly minted, embattled already, Michael Cotchis, and his police department have arrested a 19-year-old for the February 22nd murder of... Nicholas Pendleton. We have to give 
the police department props for this. We have to give the Admiral County Police Department props for arresting a 13-year-old boy in Earliesville at an alternative school. A 13-year-old boy who, when confronted by Almoral County police officers, went on the lam. A common occurrence happening here with criminals of late. The 13-year-old boy sprints. He runs for his freedom. Eventually caught and arrested. You know where the 13-year-old boy was hiding, Judah Wickhour? In the trash. He was hiding in a dumpster. The 13-year-old boy was hiding in a dumpster. Judah Wickhauer is exactly right. Limited information on this arrest. What we know now is the 13-year-old and the gun he was found. A gun was found on his person. This 13-year-old who was found at an alternative school in Earliesville, he is linked in some capacity to the recent gun violence in the area. I want to bring Judah Wickhauer on a two-shot director and a key contributor to this program. I have asked on the network for tangible and palpable policing. We saw it here. Someone who is asking for tangible and palpable policing. Arrests were made. A 19-year-old charged for murder of a 20-year-old and a 13-year-old found with a gun in his person at an alternative school. A gun linked to potentially violence recently in the area. Props to the police first. Yeah. And I think uh, for me what the really good news is is that, uh, yes, we can ask for tangible proof. We can ask for the, uh, you know, things like gun buybacks, which we've talked about being more of a, uh, uh, more of an optics uh, stunt than... Uh, PR, PR, anything else? Perception. Yeah. But uh, I think these these two arrests show that the the police are working, and we may not always see the uh, the outward effects, but uh, they are working. Uh, they are doing their job, and sometimes um, sometimes it it uh, it's behind the scenes. Sometimes it shows results that we can see. Sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I, I think we all need to know that they're working hard, and, uh, and this is, you know, this is proof of it. Well said, Judah Wickhauer. Um, viewer and listener, I will respect her anonymity. Um, I believe she is watching the program now. Let me check the heat map on our network software to see. Um, but a prized viewer and listener whose anonymity I will respect said she was at the funeral of the 20-year-old Gordonsville man. An emotional funeral. He had a girlfriend, long-term girlfriend in college. He and his girlfriend were choosing which Commonwealth school they wanted to pursue. Hmm. They were studying at Piedmont. They were pursuing higher education to better themselves from a professional and quality of life standpoint. This funeral was attended by Police Chief Cotches. And Police Chief Cotches, according to one of our most important viewers and listeners, she said she was at the funeral and she was very impressed with Police Chief Cotches, not only for the arrest that was made, but also for showing up at the funeral for Nicholas. She said after the funeral, Police Chief Cotches went up to the family the family of 20-year-old Nicholas Pendleton, who was murdered in the 10th and Page neighborhood, and he offered comfort to them, chose to speak to them in private. She said, as someone who was watching off in the distance, she was quite impressed. Yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I think, say what you will about uh, what Cautious may or may not have brought with him from Warrington. Uh, I certainly think he brought uh, personability and charm. And uh, I, think he's a, I think he's a good addition to, to Charlottesville. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, trust me. I, I spoke at the forum next to Dairy Market. I said to him, you heard the audio. You heard the sound. I initially, I said to him, I looked in his face. I said, I wanted Tito Durrett for your job. 
That's how I started my talk with Kachis at that forum. But yeah. then I said, I appreciate your communicative mythology and your transparency and how you're connecting with this community, and we need to give them props. Albert Graves on Facebook brings up a good point. He says it was quoted in the article that the 13-year-old boy was involved in gun violence within the city and within Albemarle. He says this, it begs this question, how are these children getting these guns? That was my first thought is, where did this kid get the gun? Did he you know, pull it from his parents' closet or did a friend give it to him? And if a friend gave it to him, where did the friend get the gun? I mean, it's, it's bad enough if, uh, you know, if 18, 19, 20-year-olds are getting guns to go running around Charlottesville uh, shooting at each other. Uh, how bad is it that 13-year-olds are getting their hands on guns. And I want, I want to put it in perspective. In the last, say, 30 days, maybe I'll even say the last 45 or 60 days to be safe. Why don't I say in the last 60 days? We've had a six-year-old at a school in Newport News, in elementary school, a six-year-old shoot a teacher in a classroom. Yeah. And the only reason she's alive today is she put her hand up in self-defense, put her hand between her face and the gun, and took the gunshot in her hand, and then it exited her hand and into her body. So a six-year-old is shooting a teacher in Newport News. Now a 13-year-old is in an alternative school, and he is such a frame of mind that when confronted by police officers, his first course of action is to run. His second course of action is to hide in a trash dumpster. I want to put in perspective everyone that's listening and watching this show. This is the mentality of some in our community, and we must be empathetic to it. A 13-year-old truly believes that his life, he needs to have a gun on his person for whatever reason, and then when he chooses to interact with police... He chooses, instead of interacting, to sprint and run away and hide in a dumpster. Well, he, he knew he had a gun. I don't know that we can say that he thought he needed the gun. Uh, but uh, I think we can say that the 13-year-old who had a gun on his person, <laughs> at, for some reason he chose to have one. Well, yeah. I mean, th that reason, and it's difficult to understand truly what that reason is, but I would imagine you have a gun on your person for safety reasons. I mean, I, I, isn't that the number one reason someone would have a gun on their person? I mean, this is obviously getting into the weeds here. I mean, who knows? I mean, it, we don't know. You think it's a braggadocious tactic? Yeah, uh, uh, a machismo, if you may? Yeah, it could have been uh, a way to show off to his friends. Uh, we, I, mean, I, I can only speculate. Uh, but, <clears throat> but if they know that the kid was involved in, in violence, then... He probably did have it for more than just showing it off. Matt Daring made the comment. Um, Dylan's rule. Are we good on Twitter? Are we good? You got the uh, audio from the live stream? Dylan's rule and Ginny who said they're not hearing it on Twitter. Dylan's rule. Let us know if you're hearing it on Twitter or the show on Twitter. Kevin Yancey, I see you're watching. Are we good on Facebook? If you can give us a drop in the uh, in the feed, if the audio is good, I think we're good on Facebook. Uh, but see if you can hear. Uh, we're good on Twitter over there, J Dubs. I'm checking it now. Okay. Okay. Thank you kindly. Um, before we go to the next topic, I'll close the first topic with this. How are teenagers getting guns? That's one of the roots to this problem. How are teenagers and children? John Kelly says Facebook is fine. Thank you, John Kelly. Appreciate you. Thank you, Kevin Yancey, as well. If you could check out Twitter, that would mean the world to me because I'd love to connect Sound, with everybody. Sounds working on Twitter. Okay, Ginny Hu and Dylan's Rule said we're here as now. Thank you, friends, on Twitter for confirming. All right, to close this topic, I want to go back to a two, and then we'll go Thomas Rahal and Quality Pie. Should Quality Pie get subsidy from the city, financial subsidy, because of the Belmont Bridge Project? And if it's Quality Pie, we would also have to reward Barbie's Burrito Barn, Lampo, yeah. and any other business that's in that area. Um, Champion may even fall in that quarter, interestingly, if we go with financial assistance for Belmont Bridge. 
Um, but I want to close the first topic with you, Judah, and get inside that big, beautiful brain. Here's what I'd like to know. We talk about preventative policing. Yeah. Preventative policing is figuring out how teenagers as young as 13 in our area are getting guns. Right. <clears throat> There's preventative policing number one. Preventative policing number two, Albert makes this comment, while the gun buyback is perhaps a PR type of strategy, it does, he say, says, like I said yesterday, help build human connection and trust with the community because it offers face time for police officers to interact with citizens. So the value proposition, and I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded to your commentary, as I try to be every day, some days better than others, I understand your perspective that the gun buyback is very PR and perception rooted. But he makes the comment, and I think you would agree with this, it does give officers a chance for FaceTime with community members, and that has value. Yeah, I, I can give you that. Um, I think my question would be, who exactly is, is the interaction going to be with? Um, I, I would guess it's mostly with people that actually <clears throat> decide to, uh, to turn in guns. Well, here Kevin says this. Yancey makes this comment, Mayor of Waynesboro. Jerry, you could ask around yourself and buy a handgun in less than 24 hours. That may be the case, but I'm a grown man. I'm an adult. It's very different for an adult who spent 23... I think I could buy a gun within 24 hours. In fact, I, Kevin, I'll take it a step further. I am confident right now that I could purchase a gun within one hour in Central Virginia. Well, I, within one hour, can go to the ATM, pull out $250, $300, $400, whatever the cost is, and within 60 minutes, including the time of travel, getting money from the ATM, and having the gun delivered to me, I could have a gun in my hand within 60 minutes. That's not a doubt in my mind I could do that. There's not a single doubt in my mind. 23 years of this community growing up and maturing into a man in this community, first arriving as a first year, you have assimilated to yourself in two and a half decades, basically, with a lot of different networks and a lot of demographics and a lot of folks, especially with someone who has the ability to code switch and human connect and conversate, which you've seen firsthand over 12 years. I've been in and out of a lot of different groups of folks, and I have no doubt I could get a gun in an hour. Are, but you that's someone, about, are you talking about... League? I'm not talking about going to Dick's or Field and Stream. So you're talking about uh, yes. making an some connections? Yes. I un saying, undoubtedly could get an unregistered gun. Hey, don't, ma don't ask me any questions. I need a gun. <laughs> not a doubt in my mind I could get that. There's not a doubt in my mind. Um, but the difference is, is 23 years of being in this community, grown man making that push versus a 13-year-old. Yeah. I think those are comparing apples to oranges, but I do respect your comment, uh, Mayor of Waynesboro. I very much do. So to conclude this before we go quality pie, I want to know how kids are getting guns. I want preventative policing strategies in play. And so far, I've seen gun buybacks as offering some value in that category, although I'm open-minded that it might not be as meritable as value as the police would like to suggest. Preventative policing measures, hiring the department to a full force or a full clip of bodies. Right now it's a third empty. Preventative policing measures, the three districts Michael Cotches has launched, UVA, Fifeville, 10th and Page. Preventative policing measures, the walk and talks, mm -hmm. the fireside chats or the, the, the community forums like you did at the church or it's now a wedding venue next to Dairy Market. Preventative policing measures, empowering the buck squad or nonprofits like it even more. Preventative policing measures, Koch is showing up to funerals of men who've been murdered in, in his city. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine that is easy. And I can't imagine the humility or the pride swallowing or the humbleness or the how would you characterize the emotion Conscious is feeling 
where he's going to a funeral where in his city a 20-year-old man was murdered on his watch as the top cop in the city, having the character and backbone and, and, and whatever the word is, you help me come up with it, to go to the family of the murdered man and offer condolences and yeah. verbal and human connection and sympathy and hugging. I mean, that, that, that's character. Yeah, I can't speak to what Conscious may have been feeling in that moment, but uh, certainly I think compassion, compassion is probably high on the list. There you go. Well, excellent, exa- perfect word. Compassion and humility. Yeah. Would imagine he probably didn't want to do that. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, it's... We can say that a police chief doesn't want to go to a funeral of a man murdered in this city. And we can say that with conviction. That's That's fair. not an assumption. So, the glass is half full as I close the, t- the first topic on the violence. The glass is potentially half full. All right, let's go to the next um, subject. Why don't you go to the one shot so folks can see the headlines on screen. And then I'll bring you back in on a two with the, with the lower third on the second subject. The um, coming in on a two shot. The lower third should be the quality pie lower third. But we'll do that on the two shot. Um, all right, so here's what happened yesterday. Here's, I guess, what's happened over the course of the last few weeks. Heck, even longer than that. Um, months. Quality Pie is owned by Tomas Rahal. He previously was the front man of Mas Tapas. He's a talented chef. Known commodity locally. Especially culinary commodity. Kind of a larger than life character. Literally and figuratively. He um, has been in the news of late for opposition to some potential projects in the Belmont area. That opposition to potential projects, he was a part of a group. That project consisted of affordable housing for people with intellectual disabilities. What Thomas Rahal's group, 30 30 plus people, what they opposed was not necessarily the project for people with disabilities. Instead, the zoning associated with the project and how that zoning could be potentially manipulated by future developers down the road. So, Tomas was not opposed to helping intellectually handicapped folks find housing. His group was opposed to the zoning attached to this particular project that maybe down the road could have been manipulated um, by future developers. That mindset contrasted and conflicted and got in the crossfire of Charlottesville Planning Commissioner Rory Stolzenberg to the point where Rory Stolzenberg published a tweet um, on his platform that many folks have said is, um, in in fact, Mayor Snook has has apologized, the planning commissioner, Lyle Sola Yates, has apologized on behalf of Rory Stolzenberg. Many folks have said that Stolzenberg has used his platform or position as a city official to track, to attack, attack a private business and in some ways um, seek maybe puni- like punitive revenge, s- seek revenge on Tomas Rahal because he was um, adversarial in this zoning planning um, project for, the, for the, the folks, affordable housing and intellectual disabilities. Rahal has also said that he should get money, financial assistance from Charlottesville government for the Belmont Bridge project negatively impacting his business, Quality Pie, a fantastic restaurant in the old Spudnuts location. So we'll go to a two shot. We'll put the lower three down, third on screen. You got, I've been thinking about this a lot since yesterday's show. You got a business owner who's saying, and I know him, call him a friend. Mm-hmm. 
He's saying a city official is attacking him, attacking him as a city official on Twitter, and it's causing um, damage to his business quality pie. The same business owner is saying Charlottesville government is hurting his business with this Belmont Bridge project mm -hmm. that has cut his revenue by 40% since the project has begun. He is saying that city official and government in totality are negatively impacting what he's trying to do as a taxpayer and as an entrepreneur and as a resident of the city. Yeah. A lot to unpack here. Do you empathize? Do you buy or sell Thomas Rahal's position? Are you buying it or are you selling it? Is it fact or fiction? I mean, I buy it. I don't know that there's a whole lot to dispute. Um, anybody that's driven over that bridge can see how, uh, how his business has to have been affected for the last however many months. And uh, the paper uh, talking about, uh, talking about how, um, how the tweets may have affected him. I mean, the paper even, even uh, wrote about the fact that, uh, that there were citizen groups considering a, uh, you know, considering a, um, a protest or a ban or whatever you want to call it based on, uh, based on the tweet. So I don't know that there's anything to dispute in the fact that he's been affected by both the city and the tweet. Should the city provide financial assistance? That's a different question. Uh, it's a different question. It's I, a different question altogether. Which yeah. is more negatively impact his business is the second question. Stolzenberg's critical Twitter, um, Stolzenberg's critical tweet or the Belmont Bridge Project? That's obvious. Obviously, yeah. it's the Belmont Bridge Project, which has been going on. Yeah, um, without question. It seems like for the entire tw two decades plus that I've been here, it's been discussed. Um, does the city owe him money? You know, I, does the city owe him money now even more because a city official attacked him on social media? Is the city more likely to give think, him financial assistance now that that tweet was published by Roy Solzenberg? Is he more likely to get the financial assistance? I think I think, uh, and and this might be a a tall order to fill. I think he, if somebody thought that he uh, that he deserved money because of the tweet, there would have to be proof uh, of uh, of lost lost revenue. I think from Rory's and, tweet, and that would be I think that would be pretty hard to do. That'd be incredibly difficult to quantify. Yeah. Incredibly difficult to quantify. <clears throat> Attorneys literally try to quantify stuff like this when, uh, when, when parties are suing each other for um, um, slander and, and personal damages to brand or image or likeness. Yeah. Um, this is literally the conversation that is had between attorneys at negotiation tables. How do you quantify the damage monetarily? It's very difficult to do. Yeah, I think this, if this is in court, it would be... It would be very difficult to show, and I and I would be uh, doubtful that uh, the outcome would be favorable to uh, to the person filing the suit. Okay, step further though. Take it another step. Does his tweet, Planning Commissioner Stolzenberg, create more sympathy for business owner Rahal of Quality Pie? I think it depends who you ask, because obviously some people are taking that tweet as a reason to uh, to boycott quality pie. While some folks are, some folks are. Yeah, while, yeah. While others may see the tweet as a you know as an attack on a on a small business owner um, who's you know paying taxes to the city, who's uh, barely surviving. Yeah. Who, according to him, is barely surviving. I think that's he, what he's saying, right? He's barely surviving. His business is barely surviving. He's saying, you guys are doing a bridge project. Yeah. At the same time, one of your city officials is, is lambasting me on social media. Yeah. Rory's timing could not be worse here. Right. 
It's like kicking a dog that's limping down the road. A dog that's limping down the road, you go out and kick him in the ribs. Yeah. That's what's, what's happened here. All right, I, I'll jump in. I do not think Tomas Rahal, and you're going to be disappointed hearing this um, from me. We're s still boys. I do not think you should get financial assistance. I do not think the government should subsidize private business except for extremely rare circumstances, COVID, pandemic, when government forces customers to stay at home yeah. and businesses don't have people to buy things from them. When the government forces small, That's a subsidy example. small businesses to close while allowing large businesses to remain open. There you go. Prioritizing big box brands over locally owned brands, subsidize the locally owned ones, PPP. That's what happened. PPP, idle. That's what happened. Okay? In this particular circumstance, dude knew bridge project was going to happen. Yes, the bridge project has been percolating for what seems like half a century. And if Jehu Martin was watching this program right now, he would say, this bridge project has legitimately been happening for half a century. Jehu, are you watching right now? How long has the Belmont Bridge Project been going on? Jehu Martin is the mayor of Belmont. He'd say 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, forever. But guess what? It was still happening. And Tomas chose to open the business there. And he chose to open the business without a backup plan. And Lampo had a backup plan with Lampo to go at Ix Park. Lampo knew the Belmont Bridge Project was going to bring the, the, was going to be a cluster duck, quack, quack, quack. And they said, we're going to pay money for a storefront close to our original location to help keep revenue coming in. And Tomas did not do that. Yeah. He did not do that. And, and we don't get free passes for pass and go. You pay 200 bucks. And if he can survive this, when the project is done, it could be a boom for business. But you got to survive it. And you know what that's called? You know what that's called? Survival of the fittest? There's, could be called that. It's called the cost of doing business. It's the cost of doing business. No subsidies. No subsidies for McIntyre Park when they did that McIntyre Plaza, the Seville Coffee Shopping Center. No subsidies for those dudes. No subsidies for the Wayside Dirty Nellies, JPA Fast Mart Fry Spring Station, Anna's Pizza when the Fry Springs Bridge Project made that a cluster duck. Quack, quack, quack. No subsidies there. No exceptions made. Mm -hmm. No subsidies. Disagree? No, I think I agree with you there. Um, it's a uh, it's a tough it's a tough question, but uh, but I think you can't pick and choose who you subsidize. Marquise uh, Johnson watching the program. Love when you watch the show, my man. He says, "I've been waiting all my life for the Belmont Bridge project. Even before I came here, they were going to go through with that bridge, just like everyone slept on the John Warner Parkway from 1982." Sorry, not sorry. It happens, bro. No subsidies. 20 plus, 30 plus years, multiple people are saying on the feed. It's been going on. Yeah. And if any subsidies did happen, any subsidies did happen, Lampo, Barbie's Burrito Barn, they would get a piece. Yeah. It would have to be equitable. All right, next topic, put it on the screen, the lower third. Lloyd, Lloyd Snook and Michael Payne are already confirmed running for council. We're hearing scuttlebutt and the political water cooler chitter chatter that Bob Fenwick, a one term city councilor who's had unsuccessful bids for council as recently as 2019, is gearing up to make an announcement for city council as we speak. He's collecting signatures, we're hearing Bob Fenwick. Who else should run? I'll make this statement again. I will make this statement again. I've said it once, I'll say it again. Friend of the program, Bellamy Brown, grew up in this area. Bellamy Brown could somehow tweak or, or pivot what he's done 
and not have his name in the race for delegate and instead have his name in the race for council, Bellamy Brown would be a city councilor in 2024. He'd win one of the three seats that were up for grabs. If Bellamy could somehow shift from delegate and running for Sally Hudson's seat in a crowded field with Katrina Colson, Katrina Colson, the chair of the Admiral County School Board, uh, an attorney for Charlottesville City Government, works in City Hall, she'll join us on this program tomorrow at 1230. So for the promo post before the show, Katrina Colson tomorrow at 1230. I have some good questions for Chairwoman Colson. Collective bargaining is obviously going to come up, as will her bid for delegate in tomorrow's interview. But Bellamy Brown chose to run for a seat that was coveted, and it is a very competitive race to Sean Cooper, Dave Norris, Katrina Coulson, himself so far. We've heard mm -hmm. scuttlebutt that Ned Galloway may jump in that race, but it's getting pretty late right now, so perhaps a Supervisor Galloway of Almora County is choosing to not enter the competitive delegate race. If Bellamy had run for council, he would have won. This year, he would have won. Who else should run? Who else should run? Who else? Three hmm. spots open. Snook and Payne. Fenwick, Scuttlebutted. Three white dudes. Snook, Payne, yes. Fenwick, Scuttlebutted. Three white dudes. Who else should run? That's a good question. Um, we have to go back through some of our guests. Who else, viewers and listeners? Marquise Johnson, who else should run? Lloyd Sudok watching the program. He says he recommends the Cuban sandwich. Um, where did you get the Cuban sandwich? At the market next door, Mayor Snook? <laughs> I love a good Cuban, sir. Um, Marquise Johnson said it was nice meeting you last week at Lee Park as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was you fun. met him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Were you with Liza? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, who else should run? If you were a betting man, would you bet Leah per year would run again? Granted, run again is not the right use of term. She was appointed to fill right. Cena McGill's spot. She's run for school board. She's never run for council. This may... Uh this may embolden her to run for council. You would think. It depends I saw on Leah per year at the, uh, at the uh, town hall um, next to Dairy Market. Lloyd Snook was there. David Norris was there. Bellamy Brown was there. Sally Hudson was there. Brian Pinkston was there briefly. Both all three police chiefs, UVA, Almoral, Charlottesville City, were there. Mm -hmm. Who else should run? And is anyone in Bellamy Brown's ear, and I know he watches the program, is he watching right now? Is the King of Orbit watching the program, who is super tight with Mr. Brown? And I'll just leave it as the King of Orbit. Get in his ear and see if he'll run for council, city. Marquise, shout out to her son, Eugene, per year. I'd like to see somebody fresh to government run. Hmm. I'd like to see someone now pain's youthful, but fresh to government, fresh perspective run. I like to see an independent or Republican run. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to see the stranglehold one party has on government in Charlottesville become a bit loosened so we have an aggregation of ideas and perspectives. Yeah. What about, well, <clears throat> I don't know if they live in uh, Charlottesville city limits, but uh, what about one of the, what about one of the, uh, the Erpies? Erpies live in Almaro County. Yeah, that's what I figured. Whitehall District, Almar County. Hmm. I've encouraged Alex to do that. But he's in Almar. Yeah. T 
TV station watching the program as we speak. I'd love to see John Blair get involved with politics somehow. I believe John's watching. The acting uh, town manager of Stanton is watching on LinkedIn. I'd love to see him get involved with politics somehow. I think John Blair would be a hell of a state senator or yeah. delegate. I am surprised at this point. Paul McCarter makes a great comment. There are too many drawbacks to run. In many ways, it is a no-win situation. I know firsthand. I know firsthand about this. <laughs> Paul, King of Southside, you're 100% right. We're at March 9th. There's three spots on a five-member council up for grabs. And at this point, all we know, at this point, all we know is Fenwick is scuttlebutting or contemplating, and Payne and Snook are seeking re-election bids. Yeah. What else do we know? Not much. Um, are you not surprised by that? I am. We're going to have another local election cycle, potentially, of no competition or opposition. Yeah. Lisa Costello, the queen of Cherry Avenue. Uh, very liberal, all very liberal Democrats have not served the best interest but I'm uncertain if any moderates or Republicans could get anything done around here or get elected. I think that may be why there's so little uh, competition in the race. I think Bellamy could win as an independent in Charlottesville. He lost as an independent in Charlottesville in 2019. But it was because of his, uh, because of his, his, uh, who he was against. He was running against Snook, Payne, McGill, and some afterthoughts. Yeah. He finished in fourth. Yeah. If in 2019 he had run as a Democrat, he would have beat McGill or Payne. I'm confident of that. I think Lloyd was a lock to win. He's an institution and an icon locally. And I'm not just saying that because he's watching the show right now down the hallway from us. I love you, Lloyd. <laughs> he says he's got a Cuban sandwich from somewhere. I want to know where he bought it. <laughs> he literally put that in the comment section. Did you see that? He said he bought a Cuban sandwich today, and he highly suggested. I want to know where he bought it from. Hmm. Um, if Brown had won, run as a Democrat in 2019, 2019, he would have won. I think he can run as an independent this year on council and win. Now he's running as a Democrat for delegate. So if he's running as a Democrat for delegate, he'd probably run as a Democrat for council. Yeah. And if he ran as a Democrat for council with every, all the checks he has on his resume, he would be a lock. And I would say maybe even the front runner in this election. There you go. Um, you have some news you want to relay to the viewers and listeners on artifacts found in Court Square of the 18th century variety that may or may not be tied to uh, one of the most famous horseback riding men who alerted community members to peril on the horizon. The show is yours. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating. There's, uh, <clears throat> there's a whole parking lot that's been ripped and torn up, and I knew nothing about this until I... Until I you walked by it. I walked through it on the way to my car very often, and... Uh, Never really thought a whole lot about it, but it does have some oddly shaped uh, uh, excavations there, and now I know why. Um, it's pretty wild. Apparently, they've been looking for Jack Jewett's, the, the body of Jack Jewett's father. They, In Court Square. They thought he might have, been, might have been buried under there somewhere. Sadly, they have a limited amount of time in which to, uh, in which to fully excavate. Uh, before before building gets started again, and once uh, once construction gets started, I think the article says that they'll have little if no chance to ever excavate again. And pretty much, uh, I think there's going to be a basement getting put in or something, and basically that would completely destroy whatever chance they would have of uh, 
of completing an excavation. So they're trying to find as much as they can and uh, makes me want to dig up my backyard. Who knows what you'll find there? Uh, <laughs> my, uh, I had a friend in, uh, in Savannah who bought a place, and he and his son, I've, I've seen photographs over the last few years on Facebook where uh-huh. he and his son have been digging up the backyard, and he'll, uh, he'll make piles of, uh, of pottery and glass and, uh, you know, old bullets, old muskets, things like that, all kinds of stuff. It's amazing. And uh, I'm sh- I know that they found some things like that in this particular spot as well, uh, particularly, particularly uh, stoneware, what does they say, 18th century ceramics and uh, salt, white salt glaze stoneware from Britain. Dude, it's been a hell of a five years, hell of a six years for Court Square. Yeah. You've got Confederate statues that had to be removed. You had swarming Nazis. Yeah. Swarming Antifa. Swarming Ku Klux Klan. You had some monumental, monumental activity at courthouses, including yeah. the case of a man who allegedly killed three UVA students. You had Kessler activity, Jason Kessler. Yeah. Richard Spencer activity. There was scuttlebutt that the courthouses could be removed from Court Square and repositioned to Almoro County to drive economic development in the last six years. Mm -hmm. The attorneys and the judges fought that. They wanted to keep the courts in the same spot and not allow the courts to go to the county. I think that was a great move. Yeah. Speaking of courthouses, you got a slave. You got a, a, a slave block over there at Zero Court Square, and they and they think that uh, and they think that there may have been some of that going on at the uh, what was it uh, Swan Tavern um, back in the day. Slave trade. Yeah. You got you got a a, um, a hotel coming next to the old Monticello Hotel, a boutique hotel. A la, a la of the Cork Hotel variety, a boutique hotel next to the former Monticello Hotel that's going to have bars and restaurants for the public to try. You've got the renaming of parks in Court Square. Mm-hmm. You've got the removal of cannons. Yeah. It's been a busy six years for Court Square. No doubt. Now Jack Jewett's father's bones may be there? Possibly. If they, if they get a chance to find them. A lot of people say Jack Jewett should be more famous than Paul Revere. Yeah. Good job, Judah. I'd love to give you a headline each show where you can take a deep dive on something that you're very passionate about. Because I think you have poignant perspective to offer. Just it's a matter of finding topic matter that you're uh, passionate about. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the courthouse, uh, apparently back then... Uh, it was not a brick and colonnaded uh, uh, structure like we know today. It was, if you believe this, a uh, smaller log structure. Imagine holding court in a log house. That's what it used to be. Britain noted. Uh, Britain is one of the uh, one of the excavators. I think noted that the Albemarle Courthouse of that era was not the brick neoclassical structure seen today, but a smaller log structure. Hmm. So legislators probably met at the Swan Tavern instead. Good job. That was good. I really like that. Yeah, it's a good segment to the program. Interesting bit of history. Yeah, I like history. Especially about the area. Nicely done. I got a little bit of news for the viewers and listeners. Pack and mail on Pantops is for sale. The businesses continue to come across our desk from a for sale standpoint. And more are on the near horizon. We got the fire department driving by over here. Do you do the cross yourself when the fire department goes by? I'm not a Catholic. 
Um, the pack and mail on pan tops has an asking price of $255,000. It's been in the location in the pan top shopping center since 1989. They offer a wide variety of services from domestic and international shipping through FedEx, UPS, and U, uh, United States Post Service. They also have copy, fax, scan services, passport photos. They're a, they're a notary, document shedding, shredding. You can rent a P.O. box. They have a business. Uh, this business also has a um, U-Haul van rental service. And you can buy or, or the business utilizes its cardboard and moving infrastructure and supplies to sell to folks that rent the U-Hauls from them. $255,000 the asking price for this business in the Pantop Shopping Center. Financials available on, upon request after a signed non-disclosure agreement. Pack and mail, Pantop Shopping Center, $255,000 asking price. This business is profitable. It is profitable. Um, one other item out of the notebook, and then we'll get to your comments. Viewer and listener comments, we're going to get to them on the feed. Why don't you go to the um, two-shot, we'll talk basketball, get the basketball lower third, I'll offer some perspective, and then I'll read the comments from the viewers and listeners. The uh, University of Virginia plays UNC tonight. Tip-off is scheduled for roughly 7 p.m. on ESPN. It's the ACC basketball tournament. UVA is a two and a half point favorite against a UNC team that has, is very talented. They are very talented. They have pros on this team. UVA is a two and a half point favorite. I've said earlier in the week that UVA men's basketball of any sport, any event, has the largest impact positively on the Charlottesville and Central Virginia economy. As the season is long, as the games are plentiful, the program is talented and has victories and success, so the fan base is engaged and is willing to patronize local establishments, spend their money to watch Tony Bennett's boys play basketball. ACC tournament tonight. The next 30 days... ACC tournament and March Madness can have an incredibly positive impact on a local economy that is feeling some serious hardship because of macro headwinds. Let's hope this team has a deep tournament run because the businesses in this area, especially those in the food and beverage space, need all the juice they can get. All right, let's get the, read, the reader, uh, the viewer and listener um, lower third on screen. I want to get to uh, comments from Matt Daring. King of Cycling, watching the program. He says, one of the major tap roots in all of this is gun control. There is very little potential of that changing at the federal level. Richmond has told Charlottesville that they are not interested in controlling guns either. So that leaves Seville with very few options to reduce the number of guns. A gun buyback accomplishes that. Perfectly no, completely no. But at the end of the day, the local government can only do so much, and so far they aren't prevented from doing something like this. It's a great comment. Do the best you can with what you got. I often say that when it comes to business and the businesses that I'm running, we're going to do the best we can with what we got each day. And because we're a Dillon Rule state, Charlottesville has very little autonomy with what it can do from getting guns off the street. And a gun buyback program is one of the few options it has to get steel off streets. And that's what they're doing. Strong comment from the king of cycling. Katie Pearl says, compassion, Judah, that's a perfect word. Katie Pearl, KTP, the queen of Whitehall, we love when you watch the show. Kevin Yancey, when the city was looking for a plan for downtown mall, they did what needed to be done. Faces in places, walking a beat. One patrol officer on each side of the mall and crime dropped quickly. I would love to see that again. When I was at UVA, the corner beat officer was DJ, Officer Jones, Dwayne Jones. And DJ was compassionate, he was communicative, he was seen, he was friendly, he was humble, he was in the background but noticed and students liked him. DJ, Officer Jones, he's still on the police force today. Upper management on the force. We need beat cops where locals know their faces, their names, their hobbies, what they like to do. That's called preventative policing. 
Good comment from you today, Kevin Yancey. I agree with you this one very much, sir. And in fact, I'm going to let you know. Strong comment. Man, more comments coming in here. Um, I don't think the average citizen, um, KTP, KD Pearl, um, is being influenced by Rory Stolzenberg's tweet. No, I do not. I do not. I, I agree with your, uh, the tenor of your, your comment, Katie. I do not think they're being influenced by commi um, Planning Commissioner Stolzenberg's tweet when it comes to quality pie. Do you think it's the same type of, he of people that, uh, that are decrying the, the police department on Twitter? I think Stolzenberg is, um, <coughs> you've heard of the seven degrees or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon? I think Commissioner Stolzenberg is like a degree and a half away from the 50 or 60 people that are crying to fund the police. And I think the people that would have boycotted um, Quality Pie... Probably aren't going there anyways. We're already going to do it, regardless of whether Rory published that tweet or not. Yeah. I still yeah. think it's, it embarrassed Charlottesville government, though, to yeah. the point where Mayor Snook, who's watching now, commenting on Cuban sandwiches and how delicious they are. I really want to know how del the, the delicious Cuban sandwich you had Mayor Snook. Um, I would love to support that place as well. I love a good Cuban. Um, it got to the point where Snook and the commissioner, the, the head of the planning commission, had to issue apologies, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. That's embarrassing. I mean, it was in the paper of record yeah. that will forever live in history documenting what happened. Right. I mean, that's going to live on the internet forever. He shouldn't have done that. It was bad judgment. As it calls for him to be booted from the commission, I don't think so. Perhaps there should be more rules put in place, though. Mayor Snook basically said there were no rules when it came to this. That would be tough to do, though, especially in today's uh, ubiquitous uh, social 24 media. 24-7 social media world. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, how can they put rules in place when they basically allow Nakaya Walker to be... How would you characterize her usage? It's like the freaking it's Wild West over there. Like a like a wide open, uh, like a wide open. Uh, yeah, I hope you're choosing your words carefully over there. <laughs> <laughs> like a shoot, I can't even think of the name. Uh, like a fire. What do you like call it? A hose. The, learning from a fire hose. Uh, hydrant. Like fire a wide hydrant. open fire hydrant. I mean, that was. That was a mess. Yeah. Um, a, but yeah, maybe they could have. Maybe they maybe they set up a very basic rule, saying we have the we have the power and capability to take Remove action. Remove you, yeah, at least. And and then of course you you have to you have to let let your council members and whatever members know that this new law is in place, and be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't tweet at night, Rory. Yeah. Don't tweet after hours, Rory. Put put the shot glass down. This is the <laughs> lesson we've learned here, Rory. <laughs> and we've all fell victim to this. don't uh, I'll don't, leave it alone. Don't drink and tweet. Don't drink and tweet. Uh, we did the best we could with what we had today. We did the best we could with what we had. I thought Judah Wickhauer was on point. Um, the guy is on the cusp of winning an Academy Award for his performance here on the Isle of Seville show. We'll integrate more of Judaisms. Um, it's funny, Judaisms. Sayings from Judah. Is that anything like Judaism? But not like Judaism. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Sayings from Judah could include aspects of Judaism. But hopefully they are localized, humanized, and personalized to Charlottesville. Because Maybe. it's... Because it's... Because uh, this is I Love Seville? <laughs> I Love Seville show. Nicely done. The best we can with what we got. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 12.30 with Katrina Coulson, the chairwoman of the Albemarle County School Board. She's running for delegate, and she's also an attorney in local government here in City Hall, Charlottesville. Katrina Coulson tomorrow, 12.30. So long.